Thanks, uh, Norval. Will now be recorded. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening uh, to everyone wherever you are in uh, the world. I hope that um, it's a beautiful day. It's certainly a beautiful day here in the northern Shenandoah Valley. The fall colors have finally arrived, uh, so it's uh, a beautiful day. Uh, Norval did um, do uh, an introduction, just a little bit more about who I am. Um, founder and operations leader of SOS Consulting, and yes, those are my initials, and my parents did it to me on purpose. Um, in SOS Consulting, we focus on small to medium U.S. manufacturers, helping them to improve their quality and productivity so that they can not only compete today, but compete tomorrow. I have been a member of ASQ for, I looked it up, 35 years. I can't believe it's been that long and the founding member of the Northern Shenandoah Valley ASQ section. Uh, I served as our first chair, and no good deed goes unpunished. I currently <laughs> continue to serve as treasurer and internet liaison, and I've been involved at the uh, national level with ASQ and lead one of the medal committees as well. Uh, what is it all about today? Oh, I have uh, two learning objectives for you. One is to talk about trust and help you to learn and see that it's a competency that can be learned and applied and is something that every leader, and I hope you consider yourself as a leader, uh, can measure and can improve. Also, as implied by the title, that trust is fundamental to quality. I uh, have a full agenda. I hope that I will feed you and not overwhelm you uh, today. Uh, but first part, we'll focus on what is trust, what are some models of trust, what are behaviors that, are, that demonstrate trust and build trust, and then talk about, close off with the relationship of all that to quality using the Malcolm Baldrige uh, framework and hearkening back to a presentation that I did in the spring on the work of leaders talk about how trust um, relates to our role as quality professionals. I have a couple case studies that I would like to share as well at the end from my own consulting experience and then give you a call to action. So we're just not learning here today but we're preparing to take this out. So what is trust? Uh, different definitions if you look in different sources. I've got three here. The most, I guess, public or common knowledge definition of trust is confidence in another's ability. Their, you know, reliability to do what they said that they were going to do. And we often talk about confidence on someone in, in trust in them that they will they will be able to do whatever it is that you expect them to do. So you have an ability to predict their behavior. Uh, Peter Lencioni in his books defines trust as confidence among team members that their peers' intentions are good and that there's no reason to be protective or careful around the group. This is what he refers to as a vulnerability-based definition of trust, where people deeply know and understand uh, one another and hence trust each other because of that, that knowledge of, of one another. Uh, Stephen Covey, in his models and in his books, talks about trust as confidence in another's integrity and abilities, a combination of those two things. Uh, there are lots of myths out there about trust, and I hope to bust some of those myths with you today. Um, one is that trust is soft. Second, that it's slow. It takes a while to build and to have an impact on a relationship. And that it's only about character, about innate things about yourself, and that trusting people is risky, and that um, one, that you can only establish trust one person at a time. I hope to flip those around and, and have you think more about the things that are on the right-hand side of this slide. We'll touch base on this again at the end. 
uh, some, I'm a collector of quotes and some, some quotes that I have gathered around trust are here and they come from people in various walks of life and over decades. So this isn't just recent things, but I think the last two are key in that they talk about the impact that the trust has uh, in our businesses, in our lives. The last one in particular around trust translates into revenue, profits, and prosperity. And if you, you know, extend that, think about that, I think today we are in a crisis of trust. And here's some statistics that are not very positive. 51% of employees trust their senior management. And 59% of people have reported that they've left an organization due to trust issues. 20% of the general public trust business leaders. Uh, but on the positive side, 83% of people say that they're more likely to give an organization that they trust the benefit of the doubt. So you know, what this tells me is that trust is something that that we as quality professionals and really all of us as leaders uh, must do something about. As uh, Susan Schwartz, our speaker on Monday, introduced, thanks Susan for introducing this concept, uh, trust has an impact um, has, economically. Um, when trust goes down, speed goes down and cost goes up. When trust goes up, then things happen faster and the cost goes down. You can also think about trust um, issues as placing a tax on an organization's success or results. If the traditional definition is that results are a function of strategy and execution, uh, trust can affect that. If, say, you don't have 100% trust in an organization, maybe only 20%, uh, you, that'll cause you to lose results. If you have higher trust, then you lose less in your results. Again, that speed and that cost uh, issue in the first equation comes into line. However, if you have a lot of trust, you have an abundance of trust, then you can potentially gain more than the expected results. And you might ask, well, how is that possible? Well, when there's an abundance of trust, people will go beyond the call of duty and phenomenal things happen so that you create, instead of a tax, a dividend. What might this look like in an organization? I think we need to understand this if we're going to talk about quality. Uh, if there's no trust in an organization, you will see or feel a toxic culture, um, grievances, unethical behaviors, sabotage, um, redundant systems and structures that bl punish and blame uh, people in the organization. If you've got low trust, uh, the bottom of the slide here, I'm not going to cover every one for the sake of time. Then you've got to cover your ass behavior, hidden agendas and motives, uh, political camps, kind of siloed uh, behaviors, um, redundancy, bureaucracy that slows things down, creates additional costs that frustrate employees and stakeholders and causes dissatisfaction. On the other hand, if you have an abundance of trust, if you have a dividend of trust, um, you have a healthier working environment, uh, fewer politics, better communication and collaboration, uh, systems and structures that encourage creativity and innovation. And the, kind of the bottom line is that people in high trust organizations report that they experience less stress, more energy at work, higher productivity, fewer sick days, and overall more satisfaction with life 
in comparison to those in low trust organizations. And the thing that I think is is really important about all of this in a larger scale is that these positive things people take home with them and that has an impact on their families which then ripples out into the community and has an impact on the entire community and other organizations as well. So this isn't just about us individually, but it has a societal impact as well. Uh, there are, as I alluded to, several models around trust and building trust within organizations. I'll introduce uh, four here and we'll focus and use the last one primarily in the discussion of trust and quality. Peter Lanchoni has written a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And his model has um, five components to it in which trust is the foundation. So trust is the foundation for obtaining results, whether that be profit or other results that the organization is focused on. And his premise is that with trust, teams are able to have productive debates, so a positive conflict, to really wrestle with important issues that once they've wrestled with them, they're able to commit to a path forward to action plans and then hold one another accountable to those plans which enable the results that they desire. And as I said earlier, his definition of trust is based on vulnerability where individuals on the team have a, a deep uh, knowledge and understanding of one another and kind of what um, makes each other uh, tick and what are some defining moments in their lives and that they um, do not, that they use in a positive way to continue to build trust and to build their relationship and don't use it against one another. Um, I am an uh, authorized partner for um, Wiley's Everything Disc, Five Behaviors of a Cohesive Team. And if this is a model that appeals to you and you want to learn more, I invite you to uh, reach out to me after the webinar today and be happy to provide you some more information on that. A uh, second model that is very similar to Covey's model is Ken Blanchard's uh, model, ABCD trust model, in which he defines leaders um, that demonstrate these four behaviors as trust leaders, uh, that they are able, they have the competence to get the job done, to make things happen. They are believable, they're honest in their dealings, and they're consistent in how they treat uh, others. They're also uh, connected. They demonstrate care and concern for other people and openly share information with others or transparent. Uh, they are also dependable. They follow through on, on their promises and are accountable for their own actions and responsive to the needs of others. In the Covey model, which I will share in a few minutes, in a minute here, uh, the believable and connected are character traits, and the able and dependable are competence. So there's a strong relationship here between those two models. Then a third model, which I found quite interesting as someone who has training in the sciences, is um, some work that uh, Dr. Paul Zak, who's the director of the Center for Neuroeconomics at Harvard Business School. That's kind of something that you don't think of, neuro neurology and economics together. Uh, and he has done with his colleagues some research to prove that Oxycontin, which is a brain chemical uh, that, that we all have and that we share with other animals in this planet that we share uh, is can help reduce the fear, reduces the fear of trusting someone and increases our empathy, which is a useful thing for us that are, are social creatures to be able to work together. So in other words, we're wired 
to to trust and to be social uh, creatures. It's how we were designed. It's how we were made. Uh, and um, there are things that will enable or foster trust that will create oxycontin in the brain and then there are things that will inhibit it and the biggest inhibitor is stress and think about it when you're stressed out you're not a good team player you don't work well with others I know I can raise my hand to that one uh, some of the behaviors that that he has studied and has been able to quantify uh, that foster trust is recognizing excellence inducing positive stress uh, through job tasks, projects, um, giving people autonomy in how they do their work and how they design their job, sharing information, building relationships, and as a leader, showing vulnerability yourself. So that harkens back to Peter Lanchoni's um, model. But, sort of an interesting way to think about uh, trust here and that there's some science behind this as well. Uh, now the model that I will focus on in the comparison to quality is Stephen Covey Smart Trust. Now this is not the Stephen Covey of the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This is his son. Uh, and uh, in his book, Smart, in his book on trust, Smart, the speed of trust. Um, he talks about smart trust, in which he demonstrates that trust is one of the most powerful forms of motivation and inspiration, and that people really want to be trusted, and that they really thrive on trust. And as in my earlier definitions, he defined trust as being a combination of function of both character and competence. So both that able and dependable and believable and connected. So integrity, motive, intent, capability, skills, having a track record of success. He also defines five waves of trust, that it starts with trusting yourself. And that then allows you to build trust in your relationships and trusting relationships in larger groups and organi organizations. And that extends out into the marketplace and into society as a whole. Uh, getting a little bit more specific on that, wave one is self-trust. So confidence in yourself to act, um, but keep your commitments and walk the talk where the underlying principle here is is your own credibility. <clears throat> Wave two, uh, relationship trust is the ability to create and build trust with others. And the principle there is consistency in your behavior and congruence in your behaviors with your values and beliefs. Wave three, organizational trust is confidence then in the organization's systems and structures to eliminate the trust tax and build and create trust dividends. The underlying principle here is alignment. Wave four is market trust. So this is confidence in stakeholders that they have in the organization where the underlying principle is reputation. And way five is societal trust, kind of as I alluded to in those positive things a few slides ago, is creating value for others and society at large. So the underlying principle is contribution to society. I will focus on the three on uh, the left-hand side here. As I believe fundamentally, quality is about relationships. We'll talk more about that as we move on. So we'll focus here. So starting with uh, self-trust, in order to have trust with others and within your organization as an individual and as a leader, you have to first trust yourself. Here the underlying principles I've already said is credibility. Um, do I trust myself and uh, am I someone that others can trust? 
Uh, the, there are four key elements to that, two in character and two in competence. In character, there's integrity and intent and competence, capabilities, and results. So let's uh, look at those in some detail. First of all, the graphic that Covey uses in describing the four elements is of a tree and it's starting with its roots all the way up to its leaves, which living in this part of the country at this time of year, I thought it was so appropriate with the, the colors uh, that that we have. Uh, integrity in, the, in this model is, are the roots. Uh, might not be so visible, but they're the foundation of of self trust and the subsequent waves because everything else grows from those uh, from integrity from those roots oops I don't know why my rest of my things aren't building here but we'll move on intent then I'll go back here intent is the trunk and this is what emerges above the ground. So this is more about what's, what is seen uh, from that integrity. Capabilities are the branches, the things that allow us to produce fruits or to produce results. Results then are at the top of the tree, the, the fruits, the leaves um, that are tangible outcomes uh, that can be seen and evaluated by others. Oh, here it builds now. Uh, so let's first uh, look at integrity and what is it. Uh, probably if you ask most people to define the word integrity, the most common word that you would get back is honesty. And then um, congruence is that you are consistent your behavior is consistent with your beliefs and your values. And then third, uh, humility, that there's no or little ego involved. And fourth, courage, that you don't hesitate to step out for the things that you uh, believe in and have value for. How, as a leader, can you improve uh, your integrity? Well, number one, make and keep your commitments uh, to yourself and to others. Second, stand up for something. Um, un understand, uh, identify and understand your own values and beliefs and then live them. Uh, third, uh, be open to new ideas, new mindsets, new ways of doing things, new ways of being. So again, humility and courage to be open to, to new things. Uh, the second element is intent. So what is intent? Intent is a plan or a purpose. We typically think of that in two ways as motive and agenda. And I know until I read Stephen Covey's book, I thought of those two things as the same. Uh, he defines them differently, and I can see how they now would be different. Motive is the reason for doing something. It's the why. Agenda is now what you intend to do because of that motive. Behavior, then, is the manifestation or the output that people can see of that motive and that agenda. So those all capture what is meant by intent. So how can you improve your intent? Uh, number one, do some self-examination about your own motives. Are you acting as your agenda and your behavior to, to bless others or to impress others? Um, the, the motive that inspires the greatest trust is genuine caring and concern for others and the agenda that inspires the greatest trust is seeking mutual benefit and lastly the behavior then that inspires the greatest trust is acting in the best interest of others so seriously ask yourself 
Am I seeking to bless or to impress? And then uh, declare your intent. Let people know why you're doing what you're doing. And thirdly, choose abundance. Um, believe that there is enough for everyone and then act as if there is. Instead of splitting the pie into ever smaller and smaller pieces, work with others to grow the pie. Uh, we judge that this is an important thing to think about yourself and and others is that we tend to judge ourselves by our intent by the reason that we're doing something uh, but we judge others by their behavior now others um, behavior may be poorly executed and so that may give us the wrong impression or negative impression about their motive and their agenda. So keep that in mind. Um, the third element was capabilities. And this is really about the means in which we act. And so that involves our talents, our attitudes, our skills, our knowledge, our style. Notice the first letter of each of those words forms the word tasks. The key here is to develop those tasks to match the work that is at hand so that you create alignment between your gifts, your attitudes, your skills, and your knowledge to what needs to be done. How do you improve your capabilities? Well, identify and recognize what are your strengths. What, of, what talents, what attitudes, what skills, what knowledge um, do you have that you do well and, and use them uh, to the best of your ability to accomplish the work at hand? And then second, keep yourself relevant. Um, the world is changing at an ever faster, faster rate. And we need to, in order to remain relevant, we need to be lifelong learners. Uh, so keep yourself relevant. Find ways to continue to hone those tasks. And then uh, know where you're going. Have a clear vision of why you're using these tasks. You know, what's the work at hand and what are you trying to accomplish? And, and, and use them appropriately. Because people will follow someone who knows where they're going. And lastly, uh, the fourth element is results. So these are the fruits, the measurable outcomes um, of the work of the action. And results across three time periods uh, matter. So what's your past performance? What's your present performance? And that give people confidence and insight into what your future performance will be. So how can you improve results? Well, number one, take responsibility for, uh, for results. Focus on what needs to be accomplished. Focus on the what, the outcome, the product, versus activities just taking action. Uh, and expect to win. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when you expect to win, when you imagine yourself succeeding and obtaining the results that you desire. And thirdly, finish strong. So stick with it and stay focused on it. Um, one of my industrial engineering colleagues on a webinar shared this slide uh, that I have borrowed because I think this sort of summarizes those four things well. That um, focusing on improving your trust as an individual leader is really all about inside work. And that whether you prevail, whether you're successful or not, depends more on what you do to yourself than on what the world does to you. Because you can take action to improve on all four of of those elements. 
Second wave is a relationship trust. So now this is your relationship with other people. Underlying principle here is consistency and that your behavior is consistent, is congruent with your values and beliefs. I think it's important for us to understand that in every relationship, what you do has far more impact than on what you say. So the behavior is key. Consistent behavior is key. Your motives, your intent, your motive and your agenda may be good, but if your behaviors are not consistent with that, that will have a strong impact on the relationship. And I think that statement carries very well as we think broadly about about quality. What our customers see and feel by how we interact with them has probably more impact on them than our actual delivery of a product or service. Uh, like self-trust, there are the same uh, four key elements of integrity, intent, capability, and results. Uh, they uh, come out in 13, they manifest themselves in 13 trust behaviors and relationships. Uh, these behaviors are not uh, black and white, uh, but they actually exist uh, along a continuum that you can have too much of a good thing or not enough of a good thing. Uh, but there is, as represented in this, um, middle region here, kind of a sweet spot, if you will, um, in which that behavior is a strength. Um, it's smart, what Covey calls smart trust, and the other things can result in distrust or blind trust. And we'll look at these. I'm not going to go through each one of them in detail, but do want to share a little bit of this continuum so you get a flavor um, for it. That built strange. Um, first uh, behavior was talk straight. Uh, smart trust in talking straight is that you tell people the way it is, that what you see you get, that there's no hidden agendas, no hidden information, and you see it in a way that people can understand it and grab it and take it and use it appropriately. If you have too little trust, then um, there's you're spinning the facts, perhaps, doing some double talk or flattering people, all trying to avoid the discomfort that may come with talking straight, with telling people the truth that may be uncomfortable. Um, too much trust may be, too much straight talk may um, be too much information too fast, and people may catch people off guard that they may be unprepared uh, uh, for that. Um, going through a um, couple others here, I want to go across, well, I'll get these slides to uh, Norval so you can look at these details. I uh, want to look at, these are all character behaviors. The first five here are character behaviors, so deal with integrity and intent. Uh, the next five deal with competence. Uh, so deliver results. Look at that one here as an example. Smart trust or the, the sweet spot is that you get the right things done right on time and on budget without excuses. And people can depend that, again, that word depend being dependable, people can depend that you will continue to do that over time. Uh, too little trust, um, you will be over-promising and under-delivering. So people might not have that dependability factor there with, with you and the relationship. Uh, too much could be that there's lots of results, but they're not necessarily the right results. Uh, 
Another example clarifying expectations is identifying and disclosing what you expect of one another, discussing them, validating them, not making assumptions. Too little is not clear on what those are, making assumptions. Too much is that there's micromanagement. Go through, get there. The last three here are really a combination of both character and competence. So I want to show a little bit of that. Uh, listen first. This is one of the ones that I think really relates uh, to quality. Uh, the smart trust, the sweet spot, is that you acknowledge the contributions of others, speak about them as if they were present even when they're not, um, you know, seek first to understand their needs and then to act accordingly. Uh, too little is that you don't spend that time to understand the voice of the customer and just charge ahead with what your own um, needs and preferences are. Too much could be that you spend too much time trying to understand and learn the needs of others, but never really take that to the point of making a decision and taking action. Uh, extending trust is another combination of character and competence. And the last of the 13 is keeping commitments. Saying what you're going to do and then doing it. So let's move on to wave three, which is organizational trust. Here again, the underlying principle is alignment. And we can go back to the economics of trust in an organization that if you have low trust, there's a tax. The organization maybe is more focused on the hierarchy than the process. So you have silos and turf wars uh, and a high cost to poor quality, high waste, high scrap, um, internal, external failure costs, high inspection costs, warranty costs, maybe confusion with the employees that results in unhappy, unsatisfied employees and dissatisfied stakeholders. High trust, however, would be the opposite. You have a, a dividend, gives a dividend, and what you may see is an organization that is more focused on process than on function or the hierarchy, and that will facilitate a flow through the process that's focused on meeting the needs of the customers, which then results in a low cost to poor quality, low waste, low scrap, uh, low cost to ensure compliance uh, that results that also results in happy, satisfied stakeholders, including employees. That this uh, quote by John Whitney from Columbia Business School will, was appropriate here talking about low trust or misalignment is an enterprise at war with itself. And then if you are at war with yourself, you can't survive or thrive in today's competitive environment. Now alignment, what is alignment? Uh, this is a model from um, Leibovitz and Rozanski, hope I said those correctly, uh, on alignment that the organization is focused on its main thing, where the main thing is the single most important uh, thing to ensure the organization's uh, success. What it is really good at and can deliver uh, to the marketplace. Uh, there are multiple dimensions here. The horizontal dimension connects that main thing from process to customer. Uh, so it's alignment of the work, the processes, to the customer and the customer needs. And the vertical, which connects strategy uh, to people, is being able to, tr pe being able to translate the strategy into work that individuals, people within the organization, can execute that 
drives their behavior and their energy level. The key really though is to sync both dimensions uh, together to, to bring the customer inside and to synchronize uh, everyone in the organization with that customer, the processes and the systems uh, to be able to do that. Now, I think, I personally believe, having been a Baldridge examiner twice, that the, the Baldridge uh, Performance Excellence Framework uh, embodies uh, that type of alignment. Uh, and part of that is because it includes both um, process, a focus on both process and results. So process and results. Now, how can we relate uh, those to trust? Well, as I alluded earlier, quality is, I believe, fundamentally about confidence and relationships. And just some different uh, quotes, definitions uh, of quality from some of the well-known godfathers of, of quality, Crosby, Duran, Feigenbaum, that talk about relationships and confidence. So with that in mind, we can look at how the Baldridge maps to the 13 trust behaviors. This um, wheel, this hub here in the background is to represent the model that Baldridge uses to show the core values and the core concepts that underlie uh, the the criteria, uh, visionary leadership, customer-driven excellence, et cetera, down to systems perspective. And then what's in red is how those, how I view the 13 behaviors relating uh, to each of those core values and concepts. So there's at least one for each one of them. Uh, the other key, I think here with the Baldridge, is that the scoring mechanisms for the process and results categories all include an element called integration, which is really all about alignment, how the process and the results are integrated and aligned across the organization. And a graphic that the Baldridge uses is that all the arrows are pointing in the same direction uh, to accomplish the strategic and operational goals uh, in the marketplace, which implies that you're meeting your customer needs. So let's look at the each category and how that relates to our, our 13 behaviors and our, our trust uh, model of character and competence. Category one is leadership. Uh, so it starts out with the leader's personal actions. So that harkens back to self-trust. And then uh, governance and social responsibilities, which gets us up into relationship and organization. And I believe category one in terms of trust is all about credibility at that self-trust level. And then congruence, acting, behaving in congruence with values and beliefs to create the systems, the governance and the models and structures aligned with that. Category two is, is strategy. So how you plan and deploy those plans. Some of the behaviors that would be important there, I believe, are here. And there are a mix of both um, character and competence. And overall, the thing here is, once again, alignment with the strategy and your deployment of that strategy and rolling that out across the organization in a way that brings everyone focused together. Uh, third category, customers. Number of behaviors that would be important there that all center around genuine care and concern uh, for your customers so that there is mutual benefit. Uh, category four, which is all about measurement and analysis, 
maybe not something you typically think of as trust, but I think there's behaviors that go along with that, that, that the data pr allows you to see and confront reality, uh, to talk straight, the numbers are more objective than maybe um, emotions about things. This is all about being transparent. Uh, workforce focus comes down very similar to the customer uh, focus about genuine care and concern for the workforce for mutual benefit. Uh, uh, category six is about operations. And so the behaviors that come out here are more aligned with competence, so around capabilities, knowledge, skills, abilities. And lastly, the seventh category is all about results. So no surprise, that would be focused all on results or competence again. Uh, next, as a uh, linkage to quality in the spring, I shared with you uh, the work of leaders and shared this model of leadership behaviors of quality professionals. And they were seven uh, behaviors that link back to the 13 behaviors. A stakeholder advocate demonstrates respect, listens, clarifies expectations, extends trust, shows loyalty. A planner clarifies expectations and keeps commitments. An advocate clarifies expectations, listens, and rights wrongs. And a collaborator demonstrates, respects, listens, clarifies, extends, is loyal, and um, seeks to get better together. And the other side, we see similar kinds of things. So I think uh, as quality professionals, the trust factor is, is very important for each of these um, roles as a, as a leader in our organizations. We're running uh, short on time. I at least want to give you one of the examples from my experience uh, consulting. And I th think, no, I'll, we'll do this one. Um, this is a, a small specialty chemical manufacturing company. This was actually an example that I shared on a web one of the earlier webinars that I did. A company that um, they viewed themselves, the primary value that they brought to the marketplace was the formulation, the chemistry itself, and how they delivered that chemistry to the marketplace. They didn't view themselves literally as a manufacturer, although they did do their own manufacturing. Um, they had two manufacturing facilities and were preparing to build a new one that would allow them to consolidate into one. And when I started working with them, they had actually stopped the design. They were in a holding pattern because they were fearful of what would happen during the transition of moving to that new facility, that they had qu uh, quality defects, um, quality conflict, uh, and currently in two independent ones, and what would happen if they brought them together? They were really quite fearful of that. Uh, they were ISO 9001 registered and had been for several years, uh, but their systems um, were not representative of that, to be honest with you. They had uh, very frequent changes in leadership, and there was an intense conflict between the functions primarily between R&D and operations. Uh, and quality reported in through R&D. There was very much a policeman type attitude between quality and operations. And they were having internal defects, high cost of poor quality on both the internal and external failures uh, that was causing them to question the systems, the quality systems and structures that they had in place and to say, we're ISO 9001 registered. How can we have these types of failures? We don't understand it. And so in working with them did an assessment, but what came out loud and clear was 
that instead of recognizing the role of operations and in the organization and the success of the organization, they 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 were point they pointed fingers at operations and that the quality problems were in operations that they ignored um, R and D and they ignored the formulation, which in their mindset was what they brought to the marketplace in terms of value. Uh, we identified several key strategic opportunities for improvement. Well, first one right there says alignment. Uh, so there was an alignment on who they were, what they were about, uh, and what their key objectives were as an organization across functions. They were very siloed. Uh, so right there and there, that says that alignment, that organizational trust was missing. Second one, leadership of quality and uh, performance excellence was missing. And I'll, I'll read a couple key words here that was used to describe the um, issue was that there was uh, no clear ownership or accountability uh, for uh, quality or improvement across the organization, a lack of trust and credibility between operations and technology, further limits, open dialogue, and improvement. So trust was a key piece that was missing on the organization and through execution of improvements across these areas, we're able to build, gradually build that trust between operations and R&D by using the quality system to accomplish that. Don't have time to share this second example. I do hope in summary, since we are at the one o'clock mark, uh, that I have busted these myths and that you see that trust is indeed something that is hard and quantifiable and is fast, can help an organization accomplish its objectives uh, quickly, and that it's not just simply about an individual's character, but about their abilities as and their ability to get results as well. And that not trusting people is more expensive than trusting them. And that we build, the, yes, we may build the trust one person at a time, but that enables us to build trust with the many. And so my big question at the beginning was, what does trust have to do with quality? Well, I would say everything based upon this. Uh, as a call to action, I invite you to improve your trust, um, starting with yourself and then extending out in your relationships one-on-one uh, -on -one and within your organizations. Uh, so as a call to action, if you want to do an assessment of your current level of trust, self-trust or team trust, uh, both um, Stephen Covey and Peter Lanchoni have some assessments that you can take that are pretty straightforward that I have put into simple electronic formats uh, that I'd be more than happy to share freely um, with anyone that requests it. And my email and phone numbers are there. So I invite you to do that and then to complete the assessment and identify ways that you can improve yourself, start with yourself, improve your self-trust, create those plans, implement them, maybe get a friend to hold you accountable and commit to a timeline and and be a lifelong learner, execute them and reflect back on what worked and what didn't work and what you can continue to do to improve. And if you wanna learn, there's plenty of resources about trust. I hope I didn't overwhelm you with uh, with them today, but plenty of um, resources about trust and the ones that I used in putting this together are listed on this slide again. I will send the slides to Norval so that you can freely find these uh, resources and, and learn more. Be that lifelong learner yourself. Norval, what questions do we have? Thank you, Susan. Uh, looking in the chat box, we don't have any at the moment. Uh, we do have most.
people still uh, sticking with us. Uh, Wonderful. As, yeah, as we wait here, uh, of course, apologies for running a little bit over time, um, but uh, this more than makes up for not having a webinar yesterday by far. Yeah, as uh, I said to you yesterday, if, if I'd had a little bit of a heads up, um, I could have split this into two easily. We do appreciate your uh, doing this for us today. Uh, as we wait for questions, I am looking in the attendees list. One of them shows up as Conference 5, and we don't know exactly who that is. So if you could either send me a chat or send me an email after we're done here, just want to make sure that if you need a certificate uh, for being with us today, that we're able to issue it to you. So right now, we're not exactly sure who Conference 5 is. There may be more than one person uh, in, a, in a room with a speakerphone. It's, it's possible, I guess. Uh, so anyway, we're waiting here uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, we have Stephen Hacker, of course. Uh, doing the closing keynote, uh, the trust imperative. So uh, we're hoping most of you can join us for that tomorrow. Uh, there is a book available, uh, a trust memory jogger that also contains a self-assessment inside of it. So if you would like to uh, get a copy of that book, um, let me know. Uh, we can also you can also register too for tomorrow online. Uh, we do ask that you do um, help us as far as the uh, cost of getting it to you because we're a we are able to purchase these at a bulk rate. The more you buy, the more they uh, knock off the price of each one. So, uh, Susan, we do have one question uh, from Joseph. Can we okay. use these? Can we use these methods for culture change? I would think so, because I think a key piece of culture is the amount of trust. If there's not trust in the organization, making any kind of change, whether it is culture change or a piece of equipment or methodology, will be more difficult there will be a lot of skepticism around the change. So I would say you got to get that trust in place to make any kind of change. Thank you, Joseph, for that question. Uh, we're getting several comments from folks uh, saying thanks and, and that uh, you did a terrific job today. So. Uh, well, my pleasure. I'm obviously passionate about quality and leadership, because those have been at the heart of the presentations that I have made uh, to the Blue Ridge section. And one of, the, one of my core beliefs is sharing. So I'm not going to hold what I know and what I'm passionate about in, but to share that with others so that you can learn and benefit from it as well. So my honor and my pleasure. And, uh, and uh, I guess... Uh, it looks like we're not going to get too many more questions. Um, what we're going to do is, since we are running past uh, the hour here, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up today and um, look forward to tomorrow uh, when we close things out uh, for at least the uh, first part of the week. So uh, any closing comments, Susan, before you close out? No, I'm um, very interested in in hearing our presentation tomorrow as well. So I look forward to seeing, hearing, um, sharing um, with everyone uh, tomorrow as well. Great. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and, and close things out. Uh, there is there is a fee for tomorrow if you would like to get the book. We're able to get the book at a lower cost uh, than what you would be able to uh, individually. So we are able to uh, get the books for less, but we do need help uh, as far as shipping them are concerned. 
so if you'd like to get a copy of the book, uh, register to get a copy of the book. If you don't want to get a copy of the book and you just want to uh, tune in tomorrow, and then if you decide after tomorrow that you do want to get a copy of the book for yourself, you know, that's certainly okay too. So, uh, but everybody who has registered uh, for the first three webinars this week, uh, we will make uh, the login information available um, for everyone tomorrow. So, uh, so uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for um, joining us today. I'd like to thank Susan once again for her fourth opportunity uh, to present for us uh, today. And we will get the slides uh, to you. I'm seeing another question just came up. How do I get the slides? I will make sure that everybody gets the slides. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and wish everybody a great rest of the day. And uh, hopefully we'll see many of you on here tomorrow. Until then, uh, thanks and uh, take care. Bye now.